<clears throat> so Mission Zinc, we're located over uh, in Plymouth on Medicine Lake. Um, it used to be called Mission Farms and still is on Google Maps, if you've ever seen that, uh, right on the North Shore of uh, Medicine Lake. Um, and we provide a, well, our vision is to a world where every person realizes their worth and lives with dignity free from addiction and abuse. So those are some of our focus areas of addiction and abuse. Our mission is to provide a collaborative community and safe space where people are empowered to heal and transform their lives. Our values are around, are around affirming human worth and dignity, fostering self-determination, valuing diversity, and seeking social justice. So we've been around for a very long time. Uh, we started off in 1895 as the Union City Mission in downtown Minneapolis. And at that time, it was a religious uh, organization formed by a conglomeration of uh, church leaders, as well as some of the philanthropists in the area, your Dayton's, your Weyerhausers, folks like that. There were big um, philanthropists in the community. And it was started in response to a specific problem where in Minnesota, there'd be a lot of folks working um, in outstate Minnesota during the spring, summer, and fall. And then when the jobs dried up in the winter, they would end up back in downtown Minneapolis without a place to live. Uh, and many of them were struggling with addiction, primarily alcoholism, and at that time, primarily men. So Mission City, or excuse me, Union City Mission, as it was known at the time, was started in response to that issue um, and started <clears throat> providing primarily food and shelter to what at that point was called transient men. Um, so we started the St. James Hotel. Um, in 1927, we moved out to the North Shore of Venison Lake, or expanded, I should say. Um, and so that property uh, was used for things like Bible revival camps. Um, eventually during the Great Depression, it became what was known as a poor farm. And so a lot of the men that they had been serving were working um, out on that farm. I've heard that we've had, we had 10,000 men on that farm at one point. That sounds absolutely impossible to me, um, but that's the lore and it's hard to verify. Um, but it was much bigger than we are right now. We've since sold off large parts of that land to the city of Plymouth for French Lake Park, um, as well as uh, uh, Hazelden as well there. So we sold off big pieces of that land or a much smaller footprint than we were at the time. 10,000 still seems like a lot, but a lot of the men who were living there uh, built some of the uh, infrastructure and uh, roads in Plymouth. Uh, and actually we were there before the city of Plymouth was. Uh, so we've been, we have really deep roots in that community. Um, over time, we. Uh, stopped operating in Minneapolis and moved fully out to uh, the Medicine Lake property. We opened Pioneer House in 1948, which is the first chemical dependency program in the U.S. Um, we opened Mission Nursing Home, um, which be was opened as a continuum of care for the men that we were serving, uh, especially those who had spent many years um, with alcoholism had significant health issues as they got older. So we opened up a nursing home to help provide continuum of care. It has since become a skilled nursing facility. Um, in 1977, we built the first, one of the first uh, treatment services for women. Uh, we opened a mission detox. We added our domestic violence services in 1980, which Carrie can talk a little bit more about uh, in a moment. We opened our two supportive housing programs in Plymouth. Um, in the late 1980s to early 1990s. Um, in 1994, we changed our name to Missions Inc. Programs. And I'm not sure if that at that point when we became a secular organization or was it before that? Uh, before. before, okay. So in that time, we've become a secular organization. We're now a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we opened our program in St. Paul in, in 2001. Uh, and then just in 2023, we opened our first program since uh, 2001, which with Mission Heights Supportive Housing in Columbia Heights. Um, so I we're going to overview all of our programs, and right now we have sort of three distinct program uh, service lines. We have our uh, substance use service line, which primarily consists of our detox and withdrawal management center, which we can talk a little bit about in a moment. We have our supportive housing programs, which provide housing for folks who are in recovery from substance use disorder. And then we have our domestic violence service programs, which I will let Carrie talk. 
I thought about this. I've been with Home Free for 35 years almost coming up this summer. Um, so we have a we have three parts to our domestic violence services. We have a shelter, um, community program, and immigrant refugee advocacy program. Uh, so I'll talk about each of those. Our shelter, I'm director there, so I can talk a lot about it. Um, we hold about 25 to 30 women and children. Um, Length of stay is about four, um, 30 to 45 days, just depending on everybody's individual circumstances. Um, we have about 10 bedrooms, and we um, so it's one household per bedroom. Um, with that, that was a benefit of COVID because we used to be all doubled up, but now we decided with a lot less trauma happening when we have people in other rooms. So um, we have advocates that are providing all sorts of different um, services to the residents that we have, a lot of uh, information about housing. We have a legal clinic that comes once a month and we have lawyers, um, volunteer lawyers that um, help out with some of the legal stuff going on, whether that's the orders for protection restraining orders or divorce, um, tenant landlord issues might be happening. So they help with all of those things. Um, and we have a youth and family um, advocacy program to specifically work with the kids and the families that are staying with us, getting them registered in school or transportation to their home school, um, working with support groups of kids on how to call 911 and what to, what, how to, why to do that, or when to do that, and um, things around the violence and those kind of things. So. We are usually pretty full. We end up turning away close to 8% of our calls for space. Um, that's just a really good number to really illustrate how serious the problem domestic violence is in our community. Our community program does, um, they don't work with people that are staying in shelter. However, we do sometimes have some of their um, residents in or their clients in the shelter. Mm -hmm. They specifically work in certain Northwest kind of thing, uh, cities, Plymouth, um, New Hope, Champlin, Robbinsdale, Osseo, Rogers, Dayton, Corcoran, Medina, Medicine Lake, <laughs> Loretto, Independence, Greenfield. And I probably missed a couple of them. Yeah. <laughs> All those little communities way out there. Um, so they're specifically working in those cities we have um, contracts with some of those cities that the police will call us when they go out on the domestic, and then we call the victim in that case. We work closely with the prosecutors during that case, follow along that criminal case, provide support to the victim. Able, we're able to um, kind of as a liaison between the victim and the prosecutor to be able to communicate what kind of things the victim would like to see happen. Um, so we're following those cases. We're also providing civil advocacy that's filing those um, orders for protection, restraining orders, harassment orders, uh, helping with that. We do have a support group going on too right now. Um, and we also are doing systems advocacy, training our police and prosecutors and doing some of the more bigger picture kind of things so that we can um, provide a very good holistic services for people that are experiencing domestic violence. And our immigrant refugee program started back in early 2000s. And what um, our advocate there does is specifically work with immigrant refugee populations and helping them through processes, connecting up to um, immigration, legal help, um, or legal help around immigration, helping fill out all the forms, navigating that whole very complicated system. Um, and also she does the support group and helps with all sorts of different support. Um, one of the things that we found with immigrant and refugee populations, isolation is a huge part of that domestic violence. And so that having a specific advocate for immigrant refugees really helps with that. And there's someone who can help with all of that complicated stuff that's going on. Can you pause for a moment if there are any questions? Before we start talking about our other programs. The other thing I wanted to add to, oh, go ahead. This is really a question, but years, years ago, 
when we still had the women's association here. Um, one Sunday, we had uh, collected many, many, many individual, I think 70 bags with um, what we call the overnight, you know, the mm -hmm. first night bag mm -hmm. with the uh, samples for the odor of and soap and whatever, because we didn't know what else besides money that we could do to help the women and the uh, emergency support system. Um, so maybe you might offer a few ideas about that. Yes, we will. Yep, I think at the end we're, yep. we'll talk about different ways that groups and individuals can help. The other thing I wanted to say about the two, uh, the two different programs is that the shelter is temporary. It's an emergency shelter, usually 30 to 45 days. Whereas our community program can work with people for years um, in that their case, the cases can take years. Even shockingly, our uh, court system is very, very slow. Um, those advocates also can just stay in touch with a um, client for many years as they might struggle with various things going on. Um, so they have more of a long-term connection with clients, whereas at the shelter, they're usually in an emergency um, and there for a short period of time. Although there are exceptions to that. Yes. Is there an income um, limit for these programs? For these, no. These are totally free of charge. Um, there are, when we connect with pro other programs or other services that there might be income on limits, but for us, no. Um, and we provide, what app, when we have the ability to, we do provide direct financial assistance. Um, that usually depends on the grants that we currently have and what's available to us. Um, but we do that when we can, because that can be, you know, sometimes it's a, a $1,000, you know, back rent pay that they owe that really can allow them to move on and can allow them to find a, a stable place to live. So sometimes it's just a matter of taking care of that one thing um, that might help them gain some stability. And our immigrant refugee advocate works with people in the shelter, people who are um, working with our community program, and then some of her own clients um, as well. And she does some work around two just basic needs. Um, she operates like some office hours out in the community too, where people can just walk in and talk to her. Um, there are also really specific immigration pathways for victims of domestic violence, human trafficking, and sexual assault. So there are special visas for people who are victims of domestic violence, um, and she can help navigate that because even though there's a special designation, it's still not easy to get. There's a huge backlog and can be really complicated. Okay. There we go. Okay. Don't know what don't know what that was about. <laughs> um, all right. So I'll talk a little bit about our substance use and housing services. So the first is the Judy Redrath Withdrawal Management Center. That is a mouthful. So we often say JRC, although in the community it will forever be known as Mission Detox um, because that's what it was known for many many years. Um, we changed the name several years ago. One, to reflect a movement um, to provide both detox services and withdrawal management services. The distinction is not terribly important to folks outside of that field, um, but withdrawal management uh, has a higher level of medical intervention to help somebody who is withdrawing from drugs or alcohol. Um, and we named it in honor of Judy Redrath, who was somebody who worked at the detox facility for many years, um, was a huge um, player in the substance use disorder movement in Minnesota, uh, which we were a leader in treating it as a disease versus a, a moral failing. Um, so she was somebody who had put many, many years of her life into this program um, in a really incredible way. And so we wanted to honor her when we changed the name, despite it being now kind of a mouthful. <laughs> so if I say JRC, that's what I'm, I'm talking about. Um, so what detox and withdrawal management is, is when somebody is acutely intoxicated from drugs or any or alcohol, um, they can come into this facility and for about 72 hours, they are under medical supervision to make sure that as they're withdrawing from the intoxicants that they have taken, um, they are kept safe. So some of those withdrawals can be, I mean, they're almost always very unpleasant, but they can also be medically dangerous. Um, and so folks have to be at a certain level of medical stability in order to come here because this is not a hospital. We're not a hospital. It's a medical setting, but it's not hospital. So usually they'll or often they'll go to the ER first, 
and then come to us once they're stabilized. We also have people who just walk up to the door and want to admit um, or who are brought there by their friends or family. Um, we provide transportation when we can because obviously we don't want somebody getting in a car to come to us if they are intoxicated. So we will pay for cabs to go out um, and bring them to us. And while they're there, frankly, for some of the time, they're just very, very sick. Um, and so they're there, you know, provided comfort um, and um, a safe place to be with nurse 24 hour nursing care, um, if that is what is needed. Um, when they are stable enough to engage in a conversation about next steps, they will meet with our licensed alcohol and drug counselors or LADCs um, who will assess them for substance use disorder. Most of the folks who come to us have a diagnosable substance use disorder, but not all of them. For some folks, it was a one time um, truly excessive experience with, with alcohol or drugs, um, but they don't actually have a diagnosable disorder for most, but most people do. And if they are ready and interested in treatment, uh, our LADCs will help set them up with treatment. The ideal is to go door to door, right? That they will be picked up from this door you see right here and taken directly to treatment and, and um, start treatment right there. That does not always happen, but that is the ideal. While they're there, they can also um, access peer support. Um, we have AA or NA, or Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous meetings that come into the facility um, and whatever the discharge planning might look like, um, depending on what somebody's uh, situation is. Um, they, uh, it is a locked facility, which generally means that when somebody comes in, they say, I agree to be here for 72 hours. Um, and if they once they've started certain medication regimens for withdrawal, they're not medically stable enough to leave for a certain period of time. Um, so it is a locked facility, but people have to be willing to be there. There's sort of this dichotomy there. Um, we also do uh, court holds, um, 72 hour holds for folks who um, have been deemed by the court to be a danger to themselves or others uh, and need to be receiving this treatment. Just a little bit of an insider's look there. Mission Heights Supportive Housing is our first, or excuse me, our newest program out in Columbia Heights. Um, it produces, like our other supportive housing programs, it's paid for by what is now called housing support, but used to be called group residential housing or GRH. And that's a county benefit that is income based, as you were asking about. Um, but for folks who have low income or no income and have some sort of disability of which substance use disorder is considered a dis disability for this, um, the county will help pay for all or a portion of their housing. Um, if somebody is getting income, they pay for a portion of it. If they have no income, the county pays for all of it. Um, this is currently open to Anoka County residents only. Um, we house uh, adults of all genders there. Um, they can have a substance use disorder or a mental health diagnosis. Uh, and while they're there, we have in-house recovery meetings. They have access to peer recovery support staff. Um, advocates are on, on um, site at all times to help with goal planning or any emergency situations. Another uh, view inside, that's, that's Ash. He's the house cat. <clears throat> um, actually, I think has had a really incredible, I'm a cat person, but um, all of the residents have talked about how having an animal on site has actually really helped in their healing. Um, and people, the residents love Ash and take such wonderful care of him um, that I think it has really had a therapeutic uh, impact as well as just being very, very cute. Um, when I was there a few weeks ago, they said that that he attends every single house meeting. <laughs> yes, yes, and tries to steal the scent. Yes. <laughs> Mission Lodge is uh, over in Plymouth. Uh, this is our largest program in terms of beds. So it has 85 beds available uh, for adults of all genders. It is probably 80% men. And a lot of the folks there have experienced chronic substance use. So they may have been to treatment several times. They may have experienced periods of, of homelessness. A lot of folks there are actually coming directly from homelessness. And the focus there really is on getting people to longer and longer periods of sobriety. Um, so this is sort of a, a incremental uh, process there, right? So somebody may not be at a position to completely be sober for the rest of their lives, 
But if we can help them gain more and more longer periods of sobriety, that can help um, improve their lives, improve their health. That's another big focus here is on um, physical health, because a lot of folks with chronic substance use have some significant physical health problems because of that. Uh, we have an RN, a registered nurse on site who helps um, our clients do that. Uh, she does medical planning with them. Um, you can see, let's see. So these photos are pre, give you an idea of what it looks like pre-renovation. But we are really excited that we are renovating basically this entire program to turn it into single and double rooms. So up until this point, it's been dormitory style living, which truly is not ideal for anyone. Um, and we learned during the pandemic that it's even harder. Um, and for folks with severe mental health issues or substance use issues, it can be really troubling to have that many people um, around. So we are trans, um, transforming it into single and double rooms. These two you can see are what the new rooms look like. They're really, really gorgeous. Um, and this building was desperately in need of renovation. So Hennepin County actually um, gave us a grant to renovate the entire building. Um, mo or most of the building, I should say. We're also going to be renovating. This is our dining room. Uh, as you can see, it's a little dated. Uh, so we're going to be fixing or renovating that. I don't know that this the rec room is going to be renovated, but most of the building is. And I should say we're renovating and actually are not. We're only losing, I think, two beds, which is kind of amazing um, that we're still keeping most of our capacity. Um, during that time, we're we're about at half capacity because we're moving folks from one wing to the other as we do construction. But we will soon be back up to full. And I think it's supposed to be completely done by the end of this year, which is going to be remarkable. This lot is also on our Plymouth campus. Um, this is a similar population, but folks who are a little bit further along in their uh, recovery journey, a little bit more st uh, stable. Folks have to have about 30, have to have 30 days of sobriety before they can enter this program. Often that's coming from treatment, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and admission lodge, I should say, people don't have to have any period of sobriety before admission. They just have to commit to being sober while they're there, but there's no requirement of sobriety beforehand. Uh, similarly, they have access to mental, medical health, health mental health, um, advocacy, support. Um, and the focus here, folks are usually, I should say our, our um, average length of stay, I think is around 10 months now, but folks can stay up to two years. Um, and the focus is on creating supports in the community after they leave Smith Lodge. So building that um, stability outside of the program. Uh, it's a little bit of a glimpse inside. It's a small program. There's um, I mean, 17 single and two double occupancy bedrooms. So it's a much smaller program. There is also a house cat, but I don't think I got a photo of that one. <laughs> Heart House is over in St. Paul. Um, all of our other programs are open to folks of all genders. Heart House is specifically for women, trans, and non-binary folks. Uh, again, folks who are in recovery. Many of the folks coming here are um, coming directly from treatment. Um, they have recovery meetings on site. Um, they have access to support for mental, physical, and behavioral health. Our RN on a weekly basis goes over to Heart House. Um, and one of the things that we're really excited about offering now is that our uh, legal advocacy manager uh, for your domestic violence programs does office hours over at Heart House now um, because we really have been recognizing, as has the wider field, that there's a really significant overlap between particularly women who have experienced domestic violence and who are experiencing substance use disorder. Um, the the Estimates of how many women in substance use disorder treatment have experienced some sort of intimate partner violence range from 40 to 90 percent. So it's a pretty significant overlap, and we're pretty uniquely positioned to address that overlap. Um, and we are making some concerted efforts to do a better job of doing that. So we've been doing trainings on substance use and domestic violence. And uh, on a programmatic level, we've now, with a grant from a community foundation, um, paid for one of our advocates to do office hours over at Heart House. A little bit of a glimpse inside. I don't have a picture of Charlie the cat here. Um, Mission Nursing Home 
is a skilled nursing care facility for men on our Plymouth campus. It is a separate 501c3 with a shared CEO and board, which nobody, it doesn't really matter. Um, but what, a lot of that we had to do with the regulations on nursing homes is that it was easier to separate our other programs because of the regulations that nursing homes have to adhere to. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's, I believe, still the only all-male facility in Minnesota. Um, and they offer a wide variety of short-term and long-term um, skilled nursing, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, care. And that can look anything like physical therapy, occupational speech, nutritional therapy. Um, and like I said, it was originally conceived of as a continuum of care for our um, other residents in our support housing programs. And a little bit of a glimpse inside. This is, as you can see, a more medical facility than many of our others as well. Um, and they have a uh, specialty in working with men who have significant behavioral health or substance use disorder um, issues. So a lot of folks who um, are not able to be cared for in other facilities um, can come to Mission Nursing Home um, because we have that specialty and the infrastructure to support um, their care. The other thing uh, I wanted to highlight that we're really excited about is that recently we became a naloxone access point. So raise your hand if you've ever heard of naloxone or Narcan. Okay, okay. So it is an, uh, it's called an opioid antagonist. It is a medication that can reverse an opioid uh, overdose, pretty simply. Um, it's a pretty incredible um, tool to save people's lives who have overdosed from um, opioids. <clears throat> and as part of a grant funded project, we are launching an opioid overdose um, outreach, opioid overdose prevention outreach project. Um, one of the things that we're doing is giving out free Narcan to everybody who discharges from our detox facility um, so that they can take it with them, whether it's for themselves or for other people. Um, we've also made it available at all of our other programs. For many years, we've kept it on site um, to be able to respond to an emergency. But now, uh, due to some partnerships, as well as the Minnesota Department of Health providing it for free to uh, programs like ours now, we are able to offer it to our residents. So we do that at the shelter, as well as at all of our other um, programs as well. Um, and the last one access point means that anybody in the community can show up at our doors uh, on Tuesdays from 10 to 4 uh, and just ask for a naloxone kit. No questions. They don't have to give us any information. It's totally free, um, and we can give that out. That's through a partnership with the Steve Rumler Hope Network. So we're now on a map that they maintain of naloxone access points across the state. Um, we also can give out fentanyl test strips. Um, so those are strips that folks can use to test a small amount of the drug that they are about to use to find out if there's fentanyl in it. So one of the scariest things about fentanyl and the way it's come to be in our communities is that it's often laced into other drugs. So people don't know that they're ingesting fentanyl. Of course, there are folks who use it knowing that it's fentanyl, but a lot of times it's laced into other things. And so these strips are pretty low cost, pretty easy to just test and find out what is in the drug that they're about to ingest. Okay. I talked a lot. I just let me pause for any questions at this point. That was a lot of information I threw at. Okay, next up, how you can help. So we um, have a lot of volunteer opportunities. Probably uh, Home Free Shelter has the most individual volunteer opportunities. We have a set volunteer program. Right now I'm in charge of that, um, where there's training for people to do uh, direct service and support the staff in the work that we do. Um, but we also have lots of group volunteer um, opportunities. Uh, in a various different ways. Sometimes it's painting a room. Sometimes it's helping with the yard work. Sometimes it's um, doing a party for the kids at the shelter. Um, it really depends on your group and what people are interested in doing. We also um, have in-kind donation drives, which is a great way to support us without having to you know, come and do something actually on site. You can have a lot more people make a make an effect on that, and that's that can you can make that really fun. I've heard of lots of fun things that that churches have done, 
like they have i heard about one church that did a um undie sunday and they brought underwear for it wasn't our shelter but it was i heard that that's something that they did where everybody just brought underwear for the population that the program served um and you could do a soft drive you could do a baby shower um we always need all sorts of stuff if you think about and I know all the other programs too. If you think about all the things that you use on a daily basis, all of our residents across all of our programs use that too. And that's a lot of stuff shampoo, conditioner, lotion, body wash, soap, deodorant, toothpaste, toothbrushes, all those basic need things. We always need stuff like that. Um, of course, financial donations are. More than wonderful because then we can buy the things that we need um so that does help when we get in-kind donations if we get shampoo that's great that means we don't have to buy that we can use the financial donations for other things um that might be particularly criti critical at that moment but we will also take money anytime <laughs> um and then another way to help is to spread the word that is of uh, poor domestic violence. That is the number one way people find out about domestic violence services is word of mouth, not from the police coming, which certainly they hear about us from police and what our services are, but for people that don't necessarily feel comfortable calling the police or at least have a good call, they can still, you know, say, hey, I can see you're in a bad situation. Here's this number to call. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is true for our other um, substance use programs as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, to reiterate and emphasize what Carrie was saying about um, word of mouth too, is particularly in our domestic violence programming, we would like to be involved before the police have to be called or have been called. Ideally, we can prevent things from escalating to that point. That is where on our legal advocacy side, I don't know about the shelter too, but the majority of our referrals come from police responses. But if we, if people know that they can reach out to us before that, we can be much more effective at safety planning, um, maybe even preventing the police from ever having to be called to that situation if we can help somebody establish safety before it gets to that point. So that's one of the reasons we do presentations like this, is for folks in the community to know that there's something like this available. I will also say our advocates can talk to people. If you're concerned about somebody and not sure what to do, um, you can call and talk to an advocate and see what you might be able to do to support them. Um, I know it can be very intimidating and scary to get involved with something like this, um, and it's hard to know exactly what to do, uh, but that's why we have that support available for folks to help talk through what they might do. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add is that for in-kind donations, we do we will accept donations um, generally, the best way to do it is to coordinate with staff about what we need in that moment. If we already have 100 welcome kits, we might not have the space for another 100, right? But we might have something else that we really need. We have one church group that makes quilts for residents, which we might not necessarily think of on your own, but for those residents to have a quilt that they, take, they can take with them when they leave, um, that has been really, really meaningful um, for, for our clients. We have, for example, we have a holiday gift drive. We have a, a local church that covers it entirely. So we, we have that covered. There might be something else people can do. So that was the other thing I want to throw out there. Um, the contact info here, and I'll have materials as well as I can share um, if you are interested in doing that. Um, the two um, group volunteer events that we already have coming up, if you would like to um, join, is this spring. We're going to be doing some gardening at Mission Heights. That's our Columbia Heights um excuse me uh supportive housing program and then um in june uh in the morning we have another church that's um doing some grounds cleanup weeding and painting we can always use more hands if that's something folks are interested in doing as well those are really nice group activities i know at the shelter you've had folks do other things at the shelter too right yep yeah you know you said all sorts of projects to do so. yeah <laughs> All right, well, that's our presentation. I'd love to pause for any questions and we're happy to talk through anything you might have. So how many uh, clients do you have at this time? How many programs? Great question. Um, 
it's hard to give you an exact answer because it changes by the hour. Um, I will say, uh, I so every week I send out vacancy um, and updates to our partners. And right now, there's maybe the last one I sent out. There was maybe 15 to 20 total across all of our programs, including the nursing home. Um, and as Carrie is saying, the shelter they turn away 80% of the people that call for space. So we're almost always full there. Um, our total numbers I could pull. Um, I know our detox withdrawal management facility, which is it's hard to believe every time I hear it, but it's true. They see 300 people every year, um, just in and out. Um, our other programs that are usually at about 20. Uh, let's see, Heart House, uh, Mission Heights, and Smith Lodge are about I think 20 to 23 people in a given time, and they're usually pretty full. Um, Mission Lodge, uh, like I said, goes up to 80. In normal times, we'd have probably about 20 beds open. Right now, with the construction, we, I believe we're either full or only have a couple of beds. Um, but I, would, I think the last numbers were several thousand people that we serve each year. And our community program serves 600 people a year um, in terms of their, their work too. Other questions? Yes. What is your staff? Yeah. How many well, people uh, involved in staff? Paid staff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, well, I can talk about what we have mm -hmm. at our domestic violence services. We, in our community program, there's four staff. There's one immigrant refugee advocate. Those are the um, there's an administrative person, there's a manager, and then there's two advocates that are out doing the court stuff. And I think the, our training program manager then picks up extra stuff with that. Um, so it's a very small program. Um, then we have one immigrant refugee advocate. Um, at our shelter right now, I believe we have 14 staff. Um, there's myself and shelter manager, and then everybody else. Well, we have a youth and family advocate, and then we have um, everybody else's advocates. Some are regular staff, some are on call. And so to fill in those shifts where we don't have anybody that's going to be working. So, um, and as far as backgrounds, we don't require um, college degrees to do this work. We look more for experience. Um, and experience we can come, we can train people <laughs> about things too. So we want to have a wide variety of staff because we want to reflect the population. Mm -hmm. Overall, I believe we have around, not counting the nursing home, we have around 50 uh, regular staff and then about 50 on call or um, you know, uh, intermittent staff. So we rely on on call and intermittent staff a lot, um, but it is a pretty big staff generally. Any other questions? Yes. Can you put your success rate in? That is an interesting question because it also depends on how you define success, right? So that the definition of success varies by program. Um, so for our uh, detox facility. We have many folks who are repeat admissions, um, but we count every time they come back to us as a success, because that is a time when they have said, I need help and I am nowhere to get it and I know where I will be safe. Um, so we count those as successes. Um, for our housing programs, um, we often, I, I don't have the statistics off the top of my head, um, but we do see folks go into permanent housing. We often see with, with substance use, it's such a cyclical disease right, that um, relapse is part of the disease and it's something we plan for. Um, so we have folks who relapse, are discharged, and then come back um, as well, which again, we don't count as a failure. Um, they, they knew where to come for help and that they're willing to seek help again. Um, we're going to talk about the domestic violence side because that's also complicated. Yeah. We don't really keep statistics on that for our domestic violence services, partly because we it would not be accurate. We just don't know. People are going to tell us 
yes, I've left that situation. It's all great. And then it may be that they've gone back. We know that people go back seven to nine times on average. So we know that that's a part of, of that process. Um, and so, you know, we certainly have a lot of successes that people are moving into permanent housing or transitional housing or, you know, are very proud of themselves for making it on their own and have gotten out of some dangerous situations. Um, so I think we're very similar. We um, kind of gauge success on, on our individuals and where they're at and when they leave us mm -hmm. for that, where they're going or where they tell us the point. <laughs> yeah, so from our last um, annual report, which I have copies if anyone's interested, um, we at the shelter provided safe haven for four, 394 women and children and everybody discharged with the safety plan. So that's one of the, the metrics of success that we, with the complications that, that Carrie talked about, that's one of the successes we count, or metrics we count, is that they have a plan to keep themselves and their children safe when they discharge. Because as Carrie was saying, we don't have control or even knowledge of what happens afterwards, but that's what we can do is send them off with a plan. Our um, legal advocacy program submitted with 68 orders for protection and 61 were granted. So that one actually has a pretty uh, clear cut success rate. Um, and we provided over 40,000 nights of safe shelter to people with substance use disorders. Um, so again, we count that night that they are safe as a success, right? They, we know that they are safe and that they are not um, homeless, they're not overdosing. Um, so our definition of success is a little bit challenging and nuanced, but um, we, we definitely see those success stories and, and hold them close. Yeah. What's the geographic area that your clients have? Depends on the program. Um, so the only one that's technically geographically defined is our um, the domestic violence legal advocacy program. Um, they have, we have specific cities that we are contracted with to monitor their case calendar, to take referrals from their police department, to um, our advocates are at their courthouse and will attend, work with their prosecutors. Um, I will say we, I've heard, I work in the legal advocacy office, I'm not an advocate, but I work in that office. And they take referrals from people all over. Um, if another advocacy organization is at capacity and can't, for example, write an order for protection, they'll send them over to us. Um, we will give our information to folks who aren't technically in our area because either we will help them or we will refer them to somebody who does. The rest of our programs get folks from all over. The supportive housing programs primarily, except for um, uh, Mission Heights is Anoka County residents only. Um, the rest of them are mostly Hennepin County or Ramsey County um, uh, residents, not all of them, uh, but most of them are. And the shelter is statewide and even sometimes countrywide. countrywide. <laughs> um, and the detox facility, primarily um, we serve Hennepin, Anoka, in Scott counties. However, there aren't very many detox facilities in the state. And so we get folks from all over there as well. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we didn't even talk about our legislative advocacy, which is what I do in our community engagement, all those sorts of things. It is a lot. It's a lot to keep track of. <laughs> Well, thank you all so much. Um, I have materials if anybody is interested. I'm happy to share. And um, we'll stick around for a little while to answer any questions you might have. Thank, thank you so you much. For being here. I'll take it. <laughs> and feel free to leave any extra, you know, if yeah, you will, uh, I think it's been a while since we've updated. Yeah, we have some new, some of our materials upstairs. Oh, yeah, absolutely.